in here, we're doing a, a scripture and carol sort of service. But last week's lectionary text was Jesus teaching in the temple as a child. Um, it's easy to forget sometimes, I think, that the incarnation is not just for adult humans, but the incarnation happens for young humans as well. And uh, the young humans have something to teach us as well, which I think I think uh, is quite well exemplified in today's children's sermon. You may be able to pick up, especially after today, a theme in my sermons as of late, and it will continue into next week's sermon. During our Christmas season, which just started last week, I'm embarking on an exploration of the Incarnation, almost a sermon series. Not only do our texts for this season speak openly to our understandings of God's dwelling among us, but the reason for the season itself, the Christ child in the manger, is reason enough for us to think about the Incarnation. I'm going to be honest with you, though, writing sermons about the Incarnation is much easier said than done. The Incarnation is among the most convoluted, cyclical, and horrifically complicated of theological notions. Many of us have ideas about what the Incarnation is, but when we get to asking questions about how it happened, or happens, or will happen, or what the Incarnation means for us right now, well, things get tricky. Incarnation can mean many different things to different people, different denominations, different religions, even different to people within a denomination. For us Lutherans, mainly, the Incarnation is an event in which God becomes truly human while simultaneously remaining truly divine. So in Jesus, in the tiny manger baby, we find a creature who is at once human and divine. How, some of us might ask, can Jesus be at one time fully human and fully divine? For counting percentage-wise, that's 200%. 100% human, 100% divine. How can he be both immortal and immortal, omniscient and ignorant, righteous and broken? To our rational, logical, and linear minds, these cannot both be true. No one and nothing can be both human and divine. So as with any impossible paradox, explications and explanations swing on a pendulum that never seems to rest in the middle on one swing. Theologians tend to think of Jesus as more human than divine, a pitiful broken thing that becomes entrenched in the politics of the day. As the pendulum swings the other way, Jesus is more divine than human, an impossibly bright light in this dark world, untouchable to the hate and brokenness that plagues the rest of us, gifted truly with supernatural knowledge, power, and judgment. Clearly, in my mind, the latter seems a much more attractive savior than the former. Who would take a frail, petty, and human savior when you could have a mystical, untouchable, imperishable, and divine savior? And yet it seems we don't have to choose. Despite our desires to fit everything into a rational box, into a template spreadsheet, to figure out how everything operates in the relationship between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, us here this morning. And that despite our inabilities to understand the conclusion we gather in this Christmas season to celebrate a paradoxical Savior. We celebrate a God who, leaving behind distance, comfort, and infinity, makes this brutal, complicated, painful, violent, joyous, pleasant, beautiful, and diverse world, God's home. God calls our earth home, just like we do. The best way I know how to describe the Incarnation is with stories, and so I have one in my mind, and particularly this morning, that I want to share with you. In the summer before my senior year at Concordia College, I worked at a camp in northern Minnesota, called Voyager's Lutheran Ministries. I was a day 
camp coordinator, so I organized teams of counselors to bring camp to the kids who were too young to come to camp. We would go to churches and have a week-long camp, kind of like Vacation Bible School. While I was leading a team in Cloquet, Minnesota, which is just outside of Duluth, a few miles, I received a call from the director of Voyages with the Ministries, asking me to call one of the counselors running a day camp in Duluth. This person had been counselor to a young boy, a third grader, earlier in the summer, who had just the day before died in a freak accident playing with his friend on the playground. They had made homemade slingshots together, and a rock hit the sweet spot in his chest, and his heart stopped. The news came as a shock to all of us, let alone this counselor who spent an entire week with this third grader. In any case, I told my team what happened and asked if they might want to call this counselor too. This counselor to loop and check in on him. Well, my team took the idea one step further, and we ended up spending the entire evening in Duluth with the other day camp team. My team, even before I or my camp director knew the importance of being with that other counselor, of being physically present with him in his grief, not just on the phone. The night was mostly just hanging out, Though we did sit down on the beach for some prayer and remembrance at one point, to all other reckoning, there was nothing particularly special in what we did together. But I have to say, I had not yet seen, up until that moment, God so potently visible in a group of people. My team came together around this grief, even after a tiring day of work, they made time to offer hugs, smiles, laughs, prayer, and love. My team was God for each other. And they were physically present for each other, even though it was hard and the reason was horrific. That night remains firmly planted in my mind as selfless, as meaningful, and as incarnational. I saw God incarnated in the ways in which my team accompanied each other through that grief. I ask you this morning, can you remember a time in which someone has been God for you? Can you remember a time when the easy thing would have been to pat you on the back and leave you to it, but instead someone stay with you. Can you remember a time when words had not been enough, but someone's presence made all the difference? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you have witnessed the Incarnation. The Incarnation is an event in which God becomes fully human and shares the divine with those all around. When Jesus, the manger child, was born into a manger, when the first incarnation took place, we were gifted, as a human race, with the chance to be incarnational with each other. We have been free and challenged to be physically present with people when words and gifts are not enough. This morning, in this Christmas season, we praise a God who offered his physical self in the form of Jesus Christ, who knew that the promises found in Scripture are not always enough to ease our troubled world. Not only does this birth reveal a God that accompanies us through joys, sorrows, defeats, triumphs, peace, and pain, but also a God that isn't afraid to get some hands dirty in the hard work of loving this world. This morning, we think back to the times when other people have sustained us in our struggles and rejoiced alongside us in our victories. As we go about our week, concluding this Christmas season, I challenge all of us to keep our eyes open Give thanks when you witness someone offering incarnational presence that 
as someone who offers of themselves for the benefit of others. I challenge all of us to keep our eyes open also for ways in which we might offer ourselves to those around us. Let us rejoice because God has done wondrous things for us. And let us share those wonders with the world. Amen. <laughs>